In the year 2000, Facebook didn't exist, and nobody knew what social media marketing was. Terry Dry and his company Fanscape didn't know it, but they were pioneering social media marketing, specifically with the music industry. Welcome to Insights into Success, where today we're going to make sense of marketing with Terry Dry. Anyway, Terry, thank you so much for coming and joining me to get, uh, today on Insights into Success, where today we're going to focus on trying to make sense of marketing. And hopefully we're going to make a little bit of sense of marketing by hearing from you about your experience with Fanscape. So could you just take us back to then, tell us ab about the business and yeah, give us some insight into your experience with the marketing when you were, were building Fanscape? Yeah, it's a, it's a, we're going back a little while actually, probably about 20 years now. Um, but with the, building Fanscape was really born out of my. I was first in the music business, and I was in the I was on the marketing and artist development side. And when we decided to kind of build, my partner and I decided to build Fanscape. It was the whole idea was the internet was relatively new. This is like the year 2000, and we were like we can set up something that where we can keep artists and their fans closer connected. And so we could do a better job of marketing by actually using the internet for its full capabilities of just cutting out the middleman, creating a deeper connection and engagement with artists and their fans. And that was kind of the logic behind what this would be is like a marketing agency. And the internet offered this whole new way to do this. So instead of just one way communication, which was what we were all kind of brought up on from a marketing perspective. Here's how you yeah. advertise. Your, now you really had the opportunity to have a two way dialogue and engage. And that was really exciting to us. And we just saw that was the way to go do this. So that was kind of the idea behind the company. So how did you go about doing that then? How did you go about developing that two way conversation? Yeah, so it was really, it's funny, when we used to work with artists pre-internet, let's just say, because I guess I'm old, you know, we would hand like a notebook to, you know, a big rock star and say, put this at your merchandise table and get people to write their name and address and we'll send them a postcard because you'd have all these people who would buy an album and then as a record company, when they put out the next album, you'd just go try to find them again. There was no way to so do this. So you're telling me that you, they literally would, uh, the artists would have a little notebook and they'll be trying to gather people's contact details and put in a little notebook. Yeah. Isn't yeah, that we, bizarre thinking back about that now? It just seems ridiculous. It's not only ridiculous, it just makes me feel so old. I can't stand it, Paul. But, but, um, yeah. Well, can I, we, can I just say there, I, I, I didn't listen to it, but I heard, in one of your comments on social media, you were referred to what was it like? It is the granddad of social. Can I just yeah. can I just say that's clearly not true? I would call you a pioneer of social media, but yeah, I think granddad's is stretching that massively. So yeah, um, yeah. So, so embarrassing, but it was so funny as well. But yeah, we were we were one of the we wound up being one of the first social media marketing agencies. And that was kind of by accident, which is the story of Fanscape. We started doing that. And the more we did it, and that's how it evolved. But yeah. um, I don't know if that's the part you want to talk about. But yeah, that's how we originally did it was, we were getting people, we would send them a postcard. So we just said there's a more efficient way to do this. And that was kind of how the marketing it became like an online marketing company, which was a new thing, you know, 20 years ago. And we were focused in music, which I often say is the happy accident of my career, which was I came out of an industry that was digital in theory and online and social kind of disrupted that industry first, you know, and, and from file sharing, MP3s and all that stuff. So it really I'm very fortunate to have been in something that got rocked really hard, really early. And I was able to kind of be at the forefront of it because I embraced all the change and yeah. We created a company that was really efficient and and smart. To your point, it was like look at how inefficient it was, and look at how efficient it could be. I mean, Paul, this is going to sound weird, but like we were some of the first people to tell artists, "Hey, put a link on your website that says sign up for my email list," because people just wow. weren't doing that. You know, they just yeah. didn't know. So, so, so talk talk us through all the things you did. So you're just sort of touching on it there. So I gather you kind of were like doing email marketing. What else were you doing? Because at that stage, there was no Facebook. I mean, yeah. what, was there any social media back then? 
No, and it's kind of the thing that we realized later was we were doing social media before it was ever called social media. And so, yeah, the evolution of the marketing was at first it was like email marketing. There was also physical marketing still. But then there was, if you can remember this, there were like e-zines and little private communities. And so this is like even pre-blogs and you would find little fan websites of bands and stuff. So we were doing, that was the marketing. So we could represent the artists and imagine back at the time if you're some kid and you learned how to build a website and you created a fan site for such and such an artist and then all of a sudden a company reached out to you who represented that artist and could actually give you exclusive content or whatever yeah that was like that was new and that was what we did and then what evolved from that so we were and we were also creating little private communities of fans so we were creating little community this is this is how dumb i am paul like we we had started community marketing and doing it but we didn't really realize what we were doing you know yeah, and then yeah. along came myspace and myspace actually hired our very first employee wound up being the head of marketing at myspace wow and um they what we learned from them was it was all about the platform and the community and they what we were making private they made open and then really became the advent of the open, open social network. And we realized we were doing these tight little tight knit communities of fans, but if you open it up, you'd get that many more people and you could yeah. broaden reach. So that's how we evolved. It went from that sort of one to one or one to many, and then you could create these, use these platforms and social networks. And that's how what we were doing evolved through MySpace, then Facebook, then YouTube and blogs, and it kept going. Uh, so that was that part. And then, what I'll call the heyday of social media when it was still organic, when it was still sort of pure. And yeah. then I always point to when Facebook became public and that's roughly 10 ish years ago. Yeah. And that's when our company changed because all of a sudden social media people clued into, wow, this is a really great advertising and marketing platform. And by the way, it's free. So you had to like understand how to do it, which we were really good at. But then when they went public, everything that you could do organic sort of started to become paid. And wow. then it became almost like a media buy and we had to pivot our marketing to be more about the quality than the quantity. And it just kept being a never ending pivot. Yeah, yeah. So in those early days, were you actually physically creating fan websites? Did you do any of that? Or was it more just networking with those and the private individuals that were creating them and then sharing content with them? Yeah, it was more of that. It was more plugging in. We weren't creating the sites. We were finding them, if you can believe it, plugging yeah. into them and networking them, you know, and getting them all together. And then we would gather them really by email list. And that's how we did it. And again, the foundation of the company, which maybe I didn't touch on, which was and the kind of marketing we were engaged in, what we were doing was word of mouth marketing. Mm -hmm. And as anyone who studies marketing you know, should know, is word of mouth is the number one driver yeah. of any consumer purchase or behavior decision. Yeah. And when we saw that like, okay, we can use the internet, we can galvanize these fans and empower them as advocates to spread word of mouth and do this, this was gonna drive you know, ticket sales, merchandise sales, music, record sales, all those things by essentially creating like an army of yeah. fans who would, advocate passionately you know about something they love and if you yeah. give them something in return like you know a message from the band or we would do like we would surprise people who were on the email list or on the what we would call virtual street teams by giving them backstage passes to concerts so they could meet the artists we would do all these things that that would just empower it but that was the foundation of the marketing company was we're word of mouth marketing and that's what yeah. we originally called it a word of mouth marketing agency and this was somewhat using the platform of the internet or the platform of social media, but the real outcome was really high quality word of mouth. Word of mouth. Yeah. And what about, so with your email marketing, so how much email marketing was being done in the industry or, or was just being done in full stop at that time? And to what extent did you evolve and, and sort of really push that um, avenue? Um, there wasn't much of it going on when we first started. Uh, like I said, people were uh, a website when we first started was like a, a billboard, you know, like a band just wanted like a really pretty website. It was funny. So many of them would design them in flash back then and not realizing that people didn't have the 
actual you know broadband capability to load it you know and but they just wanted something that looked pretty because they were artists so yeah it was really early that people weren't really doing this yet as far as email marketing and then look we weren't geniuses people caught on to that that was it was sort of an obvious thing but we were to use your word pioneering that for a lot of artists and a lot of record labels and then to the artists and record labels credit they were like wait a minute we should be doing this like we we want to do some of this ourselves and we we want to control the data and we want to control all this so it went but that was how it evolved to answer your question so so basically it ended up with the the music companies um farming or developing the uh, databases and then they were starting to directly reach out via email marketing to to the um you know to the fan base yeah they would start to do it because again if you think about how from a marketing perspective, there'd be a whole budget. And again, the, what was it really all about? It was how do I find the fan base and alert them that there's a new album to go by? And yeah. it was, you had to get your video on MTV, you had to get your song on the radio. And I remember, because I used to work at a record company and when I quit to go do Fanscape, I literally said to them, I said, my parting gift to you is one of the bands that was on our label was part of our fanscape. And I was like, I have, and this is back when we had discs, you know, of data. Oh, yeah. And I literally held up the disc and I said, I've got a hundred thousand of their fans on this disc, on an email. We've we've built this email list. And so rather than spending hundreds of hundreds of thousands of dollars, even maybe more, on the first week, because it was all about first week sales. Yeah. I said, rather than doing, you know, your radio spots or whatever, I said, let me just send this one email. And I guarantee you this record will debut in the top 10 because we know who all their fans are. We're going to yeah. tell them it's coming out. We're going to tell them where to buy it and when it comes out. And I think they debuted number eight. And this was this kind of smaller punk rock band yeah. and it worked. And I was like, look at how efficient this is. Look wow. at how valuable this is and look at how much more efficient you can be with your marketing. So that was like really exciting. But again, it's not like we were the only people who understood that. So people started to understand it. I would argue we probably yeah. did it better, but um, they all kind of figured it out. We were pre-selling out shows. That was so fun. Like this is before the pre-sale yeah. with um, tickets and we were able to organize something with Ticketmaster and we were able to like sell out shows before they went on sale. Because again, we knew who the fans were and we had all our data segmented by where people lived. And yeah. it was a really exciting time. Yeah, that fun. would have been absolutely. So, with the advent of of the um, the music companies taking on board the role of managing the the fan base and sending out the emails, what did that, that mean in terms of your business and and the direction that you guys went in because of that? Yeah, it was actually the greatest thing that could have happened to us because uh, <laughs> we, um, as social media started to grow we then started to learn from a marketing perspective, okay, everything we've learned in music could translate to other industries. And so first it was entertainment and we were doing movie releases and things like that because there were fans of, you know, yeah. part one, part two of a movie. But then what happened was brands started getting much more associated with music. So if you, I don't, have you heard of like the Coachella Music Festival and stuff like that that happens out here in California? I'm not sure. No. So there's a big music festival and AT&T, which is the big telecom company, was sponsoring it. And they were they were doing like a online only type of um, streaming event, you know, streaming the concert. And this was all yeah. new. This is like early wow. 2000s people were doing this. And the or we were doing the marketing for the festival and the organizers said to AT&T, the sponsor said, hey, if you really want to activate your sponsorship, you should talk to these guys at Fanscape. And so I always love this story because they came to us and paid us literally 10 times the amount of money that a record label would pay us to do the same work. And they were thrilled because there was an artist on this stage and we knew, I think we had a list of let's say 75 fan sites of that particular artist. And right. they would have known this. They just, this was a new world to them. So they hired us to go and make sure all these people had the link and they went there and they called and said, this is the most successful thing that we've had. And being the genius that I was and my partner were like, wait, this might be a better business. There's 10 times the money here. And so we then, what we were doing for bands and artists, we started doing for brands and their consumers. So the same concept of how does a brand bring value to the consumer? How do you develop a relationship with your consumers? 
And so we started to evolve out of music and into brands and really became this agency. And our happy accident was we had the credibility because we had been working in social media for years. And so yeah. we kind of knew it. And as big brands needed to check that this new box on their checklist of like, I got to buy TV, print, radio. Now all of a sudden there was digital and then there was social media. They didn't know who to turn to. And we, we kind of fit that. And so that really helped us evolve into different territories. From our so this isn't a, a marketing question. This is a business question. So you're at that point. Did you sort of think about, well, we're early here. We should really throw a lot of money at this and try and really scale quickly and capture a big part of the market. Or did you kind of just think, well, OK, well, we'll just we'll just grow sort of fairly organically. You know um, what what happened? Did did you have that sort of thought and what, what did you decide to do? What happened? Well, you know, from a business perspective, Paul, this is like, you know, hindsight is the greatest thing, right? If only yeah, I knew 2020. Then, yeah, if only I knew then what I knew now, what yeah. I know now, because the what happened was we built, well, I think I'm leaving this out. So from the email marketing and the online marketing, we all of a sudden built this database that was massive and powerful. We had millions of music fans in our email database. Plus we had um, websites and affiliates, you know, all over that we had developed basically on the back of all these music artists that we represented. Yeah. And so we knew, like I was always thinking, okay, Universal Music Group or one of these big things, they'll just come and buy our company because they'll want to have this asset of the data and they'll yeah. want us. But quite frankly, I was in the, sort of tactician entrepreneur mindset of like, I just got to make payroll, you know, and I just got to make money. So I wasn't thinking about the enterprise value and what we had really, what we were sitting on. Yeah, I was thinking about it to some degree, but I wasn't positioning it right. Didn't have the right people, wasn't having the right conversations. So we were never able to really truly realize the value of what we had built um, as far as just a business owner, because I think that's the question you're asking. And, yeah. Uh, and so can I can I pause you there because that brings yeah. me to another question. And again, I know I kind of this is supposed to be marketing, but there's too many great opportunities to ask pure business questions. Sure. So what about the whole thing then? Because of one of the big issues for small businesses or uh, business owners is they tend to get sucked into working in their business all the time and don't pause and step out and work on their business. Yep. From what you're telling me, do you feel that you sort of fell into that category of largely just being so consumed by the day to day that you didn't didn't um, take maybe the time and hindsight that you would have to reflect at the time and maybe strategize or or was financial situation more of a, an influence as well, too? Yes, it was definitely way more working in the business than on it. It was also just a lack of knowledge. You know, I, I hadn't had these experiences we hadn't and we didn't surround ourselves with experts or people who had done this before or could take us further faster right and, yeah. and our relationships were not at the levels that they needed to be even at the big music companies and or we weren't showing up the right way so it was kind of a bunch of learnings um, but when you look back and you're like, wow, we were really sitting on something valuable. We were really pioneering something. And again, I'm not complaining. We wound up creating an agency and had a good exit and did well. But in those early stages of being a music marketing company, yeah, yeah we kind of we we fell into that trap for sure. And so that's definitely a learning. And that's it's funny. That's why I set up the company I have now, which is Future Proof Advisors, which is to help companies that are in that realm, help them see what else is out there, what the vision could be and help them future proof themselves forward so they don't um, yeah. miss maybe an opportunity like we had. Yeah, well, that's, uh, there's two things that's kind of crossing my mind as you're talking there. One was the fact that isn't it great, you know, for somebody else to talk to somebody you like you yourself, who can then impart your experience on them so that they avoid making the mistakes that you've made and fast track what they're trying to achieve. The other thing that crossed my mind too, though, is I'm interested to get your feedback on it, is to what extent that today entrepreneurs are better supported, that it's easier to get venture capital, it's easier to find mentors, et cetera, to help them so that they can fast track things. Because we look at so we look at what you've done, 
versus someone say if we, we were to replicate that now similar circumstances do you think that they would have a better opportunity of, of really maximizing it maximizing the opportunity because of um yeah greater infrastructure around to assist them do you think that's the case do you think we've evolved in that regard so it makes it easier totally have evolved and that's really because look at us right now you're in new zealand and i'm in the us i mean this just wasn't possible 20 years ago and yeah. even if it was you could figure it out it wasn't the norm and covid accelerated the inevitable so now all of these technologies just moved faster and people as an entrepreneur have access to way more information way more knowledge and way more uh just resources and so you know there wasn't even google that like right now it's like knowledge is becoming like commoditized so there's nothing you can't learn there's nothing you can't find and there's no one you can't reach and yeah. years ago that wasn't the case now you still have to have a valuable product or a service or a real reason for being but yeah. no question there's so much more ability to surround yourself with smart people learn from smart people but also have access to capital yeah. in ways that just we couldn't have even dreamed of years ago and that's what's so exciting about the time we live in right now yeah yeah i oh, know and it's just the amazing thing is that it's it's only like 20 years I mean, we think you know 20 years really in the scheme of things is not long but how far have we come i mean how old's facebook it's a bit over 10 years old yeah it's probably closer to 15 i would 15? guess yeah so, so yeah. you look what what they've done in 15 years it's quite quite incredible really yeah and it was so um you know being early on the marketing side of social media for those of us who were in it it was so obvious and it was so clear and it was so exciting but it took years for like yeah. the establishment to sort of recognize oh wow this is a great marketing tool or marketing engine and then there were a lot of companies that didn't like it because they're like i don't really want to hear from my consumers and i don't <laughs> really want to have that <laughs> level of transparency and engagement so there was a whole yeah. reckoning there as well but yeah, yeah it's today it's it's great and it makes marketing so much more efficient and it also makes it easier for people to start their own companies which is why you're seeing more people start up companies now than ever yeah i think it's lockdown from covid meets you know opportunity and so yeah. It's an interesting time for sure. It's fun. So for you, what, what were some key lessons um, that you learned in terms of your marketing from your experience with Fanscape? What, what were some key takeaways that you, you've had from that experience? Yeah, again, looking back, it's so easy. And you just <laughs> wish, like, I just wish I could go back and tell 20, yeah. years, you know, 20 years ago. But the number one thing, and it's like a motto I live by, that the biggest lesson was change is inevitable and struggle is optional. Like, yeah. You just have to always know change is going to keep coming. Um, and that was one big lesson. The other, from a marketing perspective, was be adaptable, be flexible, be agile, and always be willing to pivot. Like, again, so I just described to you, we went from email marketing to sort of digital online to MySpace to Facebook. Then, you know, now it's, you know, it's everything, TikTok, Instagram, like you name yeah. it. And you just have to keep rolling with it rather than, you know, being stuck in your way. Um, yeah. But then foundationally, the lesson is listen to your cu customers and listen to the marketplace. Like I remember early on for us, I was resisting flipping things to MySpace because I'm like, wait a minute, I built this great thing. We built this email thing. We built these communities. But then you have to like get over yourself and go, no, I, you know, there's a concept of creative destruction. Even when you have something going, like you still yeah. break it down and build it again. So I would say, listen to the marketplace and customers. And then the last lesson was like, study behaviors like, and engage with consumers where they want to engage, not where you want them to engage with yeah. you, but where they want to be. And those are some of the key lessons from a marketing perspective that, that I learned. And, and uh, the more we were able to pivot and not be the MySpace company or the Facebook company, but rather the consumer engagement company or the word of mouth company, and we were just using whatever the right platform was at the time to market that message. Yeah, that was that was valuable. So for small businesses today, you've got, you know, just a plethora of options for social media. And typically when we're talking small, I mean, really small businesses, I mean, talk could be like one person through, you know, 10 
10 people, maybe 20 sort of thing. So really small. So limited resource. What I mean, what's your sort of advice to them about social media? Because there, there is so many platforms. What what should they do, do you think? What's a good approach for a small business with limited resource? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And it's something that they have to look at. I, number one is focus on your goal. Like what I find small businesses, they'll just start advertising, but they're not even sure what they're advertising for. So like, what's the goal and the outcome you're looking for? And then what what is your target customer and what do you think they care about? So if you start there, that's yeah. number one. I see a lot of people miss that. Then when it comes to the actual platforms, if you're a B2B company, you know, I would say, you know, business to business, the biggest thing I notice people miss is LinkedIn. They literally don't look, they look at LinkedIn as like an online resume rather than a B2B business marketing community social, you know, network. Um, yeah. So LinkedIn is a great avenue if you're B2B services. Um, if you want to be this thought leader, like Twitter is a great thing. If you just want to advertise because you're a B2C thing, then you start looking at Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, TikTok. There's all, you know, social selling is a big element. So it's, it. but what I would say is the, the beauty for a small business is you get to like test and learn. You know, um, you can just do the smallest little micro buy on LinkedIn or the smallest little thing on Facebook and test and you can continually optimize it. Whereas years ago, you weren't able to be that stealth and, you know, specific with your marketing. So it, it helps dramatically. So that's what I would do. A lot of test and learn. And so what about, though, in terms of the amount of platforms you're on? I mean, like my observation is that often what happens is that small businesses kind of feel that they need to be across all social media. And philosophically, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, my opinion is you better be on less, but do it well, because social media can suck up so much of your time. You know, when you when you look at particular flat platforms and feedback from people that have gained a lot of traction on them, the consistent message is that you really need to delve quite deeply into a platform to really get that traction. If you just put up a post every so often, that's just not really going to cut it these days. There's so much competition out there that you really need to be on that platform and really connect with other people on the platform, be involved in discussions and so forth. So What's your take on it? You know, should they just try and be on everything? Should they just pick one or two platforms? Um, yeah, what's your advice and what are the things for them to watch out for? You know, it's a great question because you see people like I used to say in our own ventures, I'm like, let's look alive, right? Let's like, let's not be there. Let's not not be there, but let's look alive where it's relevant to our customer base. So again, it's back to what we're talking about is like, Focus on your goal, who the customers are, where they live, right, where they engage, and what value you're going to bring. The, 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 if you just have the strategy, I'm going to be on all these platforms, it's like, why? You know, ask yeah. yourself why and what value are you bringing? Because if you're just noise, to your point, Paul, it's like you're just making noise and no one's really seeing you. Yeah. Because so much of this now is if you don't have a following, the algorithm's not going to pick you up. And then you have to pay for it and you have to be very smart about what you're paying for and what you're doing. Yeah. So I think there's just a lot, of, again, back to the test and learn. But where I would go with it is what's going to work, right? So try those LinkedIn ads, try the Facebook or Instagram ads. Then certainly you don't want to ignore, I'm sorry if I bring back the last question, but you don't want to ignore things like SEM and SEO and sort yeah. of the performance marketing things and start trying to share content as well. But the number one thing is like, what are you doing that's valuable? Like if you're just putting out noise, who cares? If you're gonna put out something like, what is the value that your company or your service or whatever it is provides, yeah. represent that value, put it out there and in some kind of valuable content piece. And then if that performs, meaning some traction, somebody likes it, somebody looks at it or you get a inbound lead, then you kind of know I'm gonna go in that direction. and then. Just keep trying different things. But I don't think you have to be on every platform. I think as a business, yeah. it's, you have to be on LinkedIn. I think it looks weird if you're not. And then it really depends on what you're doing. Like there's one company I work with and they're all about Pinterest, TikTok and Instagram because it's very visual and there's things they're doing. And yeah. then there's other companies where they focus all their energy on LinkedIn and Facebook actually because 
their network of their and their demographic of their audience. So it really does depend, but that that's what I'd recommend. And what about what's your view on um, businesses creating a blog as opposed to just publishing their content on social media? Well, I'm a big fan of the blog, but the the blog is certainly it shows your thought leadership. It shows the quality. But let's be honest, from a marketing perspective, it helps you with SEO. So if you're putting the right tagging in the right words and then you're going to help your own visibility when people are searching for whatever your goods or services is, you know, so that's some of the advice I like to give is you want to be discoverable. So if somebody's out there looking for what you do, you better make sure they can find you. And so that's usually they're going to Google search. That's the number one way they're going to find it. And so you want to have the right kind of organic things coming up. And that's where being active on Twitter can help because that can come up in the search as well as having a blog and things like that. So yes, I'm a big fan of you write the blog, you share it on social media, yeah. but you can use it that way. I, there's a mantra I often share with people, which hopefully this helps from marketing a small business, because that's your question, which is yeah. good things are attracted, not pursued. So if you keep right. kind of putting out your value and whatever that is, you're hopefully going to attract back what it yeah. is. You may have to amplify that with some advertising or some different things, But if you just keep thinking from that perspective and it goes back to my word of mouth concept, you know, if you do a great job for your customers and your that that will help as well. They'll market for you. Okay. And what about again the small business? Are they should they try and learn the skills to do all this sort of marketing themselves, or should they go and find an outside party and contract them and to do it themselves? What's your what's your view? You know, I would go back to who, what's the skill set of the person in that business. If they are this amazing marketer and that's their background and that's their love, they should do it. If they're this great operator or like a creative designer and they have no idea how to do this stuff, then it's probably pretty smart to get an expert. So it's yeah. really about the self-awareness of how to do it. But if you're a I will say this though, if you're a one person shop, two people, whatever, like This is, it's not hard. Like you can figure this stuff out to all of the platforms credit, whether it's Google, Facebook, they have tutorials. They can't wait to help you um, self-serve how you do the advertising. And quite frankly, if you just Google it, like there's so many people or go on YouTube, there's so many people who explain to you how to do this kind of stuff. There's really, you really can figure it out if you've got the energy and sort of the mindset for it. Yeah, I guess the thing, though, for small businesses, though, is to me, they're often one of the common complaints is scarcity of time. Yeah, they're, they're constantly so busy because they're trying to be a jack of all trades because they're small. They can't afford to have, you know, a marketing manager and they can't afford to have this and that. that. So the the owner of the business tends to end up doing a whole bunch of things. And I think when that you're in that environment, then it becomes very problematic to then do some of these things and like you touched on before really that they need to step back and consider where can they offer the most value where are they most productive what is their thing that they bring to the table more than anything else and focus in on that and bring in other people to help them in other areas whereas if they try and do things that they're maybe not really in their skill set but um, they're doing it because they figure they can't afford it the issue is that potentially their productivity is dropping because they're not then doing other things that they would they could have done with that time, and therefore overall the business can actually be harmed by it. You know, whereas they'd be better off to just bring someone in to do that part that that's really not their skill set. Perfectly said. I couldn't have said it better. I completely agree with you. And it's a, there's somebody who has this concept that I love, which is who not how, right? It's like if I can't do it or that's not my unique skill. Yeah. Who's going to do it for me? And and that's what it's exactly that mindset to get to the results faster if you're sort of a solo outfit. No question about it. Yeah. So I'm just conscious of time. So what would your advice be for small businesses, you know, in terms of just giving them some general advice for their marketing? You know, if they've got a limited budget, they've got limited time. Where do you think they'll get the greatest value? This might sound cliche. The number one thing is focus on your customer. Even if you only have one customer, they've got to have the greatest experience 
the greatest value proposition of working with you because they will be your number one marketer because the word of mouth and the advocacy from that. So I see so many people skip that step of just delivering and over delivering for that client or that customer and they go right to the marketing. How do I find more? And they forget that they've already acquired some. So that would be my number one. And then my number two is what we were talking about. Test and learn in the marketing. Dip your toe in the water in different areas. Um, really do a little bit of homework and, and understand who you are, who is your target audience, and where do they live, and where can I engage with them and find them. And in the marketing, make sure you're always adding value. Don't always talk about how great your service is or how great you are. Talk about the outcome or the result that you're going to provide for that other you know, that end customer. Yeah. And, and there's so many different things, whether it's happiness or joy because, you know, or you feel good because it's a clothing thing or it helps your health or it's a marketing product. You know, there's all these different ways, but just focus on the outcome for your end user, if you will, or your customer. And that's a much better way to kind of communicate value and market. So basically what you're telling me, which I 100% agree with, is that in, in your sort of 20 years of experience, it hasn't changed insofar as the number one thing, despite 20 years, is still your customer, understanding your customer, knowing your customer, and, and focusing on doing the best job you possibly can with them, and word of mouth. So that hasn't changed. A lot of things have changed, but you're telling me that has not changed. Yeah, and listening to them, right? So, and yeah. I would say 20 years ago, you could have an excuse, right? You could go, I don't know how to get this information. I don't know. Like now there are zero excuses. They are yeah. rating you online. They are reaching out. They are calling out for the service. So yeah, the number one thing you can do, and that's what's exciting about technology and marketing and social and all these elements now, is it's so much easier and so much more plentiful to be able to get this data and get these insights and have these kinds of interactions that there's really no excuse not to. So we're in a position now where you can switch it. And instead of like barfing out all this great stuff about yourself, you can actually listen, engage and, and, and be helpful. And so it's a really exciting time. But yes, the foundationally, that is still my you know consumer engagement and yeah. driving word of mouth and providing value are still the foundations of yeah. everything I do and technology keeps making it easier and more interesting and now there's just too much data. So yeah. now it's trying to figure out, you know, what matters and how do I impact it? So it's, and it's trying to stay ahead. I just want to introduce very briefly about branding and how you see branding because in my experience, a lot of businesses remain small businesses. And one of the key reasons, in my opinion, they remain small businesses is because they ignore the potential of branding. Can you just give us a, a quickly speak to that and your view on branding and what, if any difference, that can potentially make to a small business in its ability to then scale and become a, a more substantial business? Yeah, branding has never been more important than it is right now. So I totally agree. And if you just think about people no longer buy what you do, they buy who you are. And so everything now is purpose-based, mission-based, especially with the next generations and younger generations. So brand is everything, right? And beyond brand, it's like, what do you stand for? So you definitely want to establish that, um, who you are, what you're about, what you know, problems you're solving, and yeah, what you're, yeah. and, and the branding is critical um, in every which way. So I agree, I, I applaud you for bringing it up. And I agree that it's something people don't want to avoid. I mean, there's, yeah. So everything from, it's not just your logo, by the way. It's no, no. stand for. No, but a lot of people yeah. think that. They're like, oh, they oh do. I, I came Absolutely. up with a logo. But it's like, no, it's, what does that mean? What does that brand mean? What does that convey? And how are you getting that out there? Like back to Fanscape, I'll give you a great example. When we started, the F in Fanscape was like a musical note. You know, yeah. so that was kind of conveying that we were doing something new and it was tied to music. And our little happy accident was our building where our office was just so happened to be on a super busy street in Hollywood. And so we put a sign up that just had the name of the company. And I can't tell you how many people to this day are like, I've heard of your company. And I'm like, did you used to always commute through this area? And they're like, yeah, they're like yeah. you couldn't miss the sign, wow. you know, so it's just kind of funny that the brand 
from this purely just literally getting it out in front of people meant something, but then we actually, it stood for something too, which was connecting artists and their fans. Yeah. So two things I want to say quickly. One is totally agree. So many people think the brand is just the logo. Don't understand that that's just a very small part of it. The other thing is it comes back to what you said earlier about really being close to your customers and getting to know them. It's through that interaction that you can start the building blocks of building your brand. How you interact with them, their perception of you is the, the, is the beginning of the formulation of your brand. Yeah, that's right. You know, it all comes back together, doesn't it? It's absolutely true. You know, one person said to me, your name is your brand, right? Just yourself. You are your own brand, let alone the company. So you always want to remember that. And that's, yeah, how you interact, how you behave, your values, all those things make up your brand. And yeah. that's, you know, for each company. And then the culture is a big part of that, too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I know I need to let you go. Um, you. I could talk to you for ages longer, um, but it's been really good. It's been really fun to talk to you and, as always, educational and inspiring. So thank you very much, Terry, for your time today. It's been awesome. Thanks, Paul. Thanks so much for having me. And I really hope this is helpful to your listeners too. Yeah, no, absolutely. And we'll be in touch um, again soon. So enjoy the rest of your day and uh, you talk to you next time. Okay. Thanks so much, Paul. Good to see you. All right. Take care, Terry. See ya. Okay, bye. Bye.